Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to the first ever lecture of Persist Grand Rounds, a new series of online lectures that we are proud to host. The series will cover topics related to advanced EEG analysis for improving outcomes in both neurocritical care and epilepsy monitoring environments. My name is Marie Terrell. I am the Director of Product Management with Persist, here to introduce our first speaker and topic for Persist Grand Rounds. I am joined by Dr. Stacy, and he's managing the slides here for me. So next slide, please, Dr. Stacy. Through our customers, we understand the importance of investing in the EEG community through education, where expertise and knowledge can grow towards the utilization and implementation of EEG and quantitative EEG. The goal of Persist Grand Rounds is to provide a platform for those with clinical expertise on topics of advanced EEG analysis as a way to connect with a broader community to share their expertise and knowledge so that we can all learn and grow together. Each online lecture will feature an experienced epileptologist or neurophysiologist presenting on a topic of their choice as it relates to EEG monitoring and analysis. Please visit www.persist.com slash grand rounds to keep up to date. The schedule is sub subject to change. Next slide. The opinions and viewpoints of each speaker are solely their own and do not represent Persist or any other commercial entity or commercial interest. Speakers are not required to include Persist its software, products, or services. The content presented was not prepared or edited by Persist. Persist is not providing any form of compensation. Next slide. The talk will be about 60 minutes in length and there will be time for questions after the talk. So there's a, a little box at the bottom of your screen called Q&A. You can write your question in that box and we'll have time to answer some of them at the end. A recording of this webinar will be made available to all participants afterwards. Without further ado, I would like to introduce to you Dr. William Stacy, Associate Professor of Neurology and Biomedical Engineering at the University of Michigan. Dr. Stacy received both his medical degree and his PhD in Biomedical Engineering from Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland. He completed a neurology residency at the University Hospitals of Cleveland. He then went to the University of Pennsylvania where he completed a clinical fellowship in epilepsy, then became a clinical instructor while concurrently completing a postdoctorate in basic epilepsy research. While there, he also received a master's of translational medicine. Dr. Stacy's clinical and research interests are integrally connected. He cares for adult patients with epilepsy and has an active research lab researching methods to develop improved seizure control devices and analytical tools. His research involves expertise in both biomedical engineering and clinical epilepsy with the goal that these techniques may uncover new methods of treating seizures in people with uncontrolled seizures. Dr. Stacy, off to you. All right, thank you very much. Um, first, I have this disclosure, which isn't all that pertinent for what I'm talking about today. First, to start off, just like to show you two pieces of EEG from a patient taken at different times. And those of us that read EEG will immediately notice there is a difference between the top and the bottom. And actually, uh, even if you have no experience at all, it would be pretty obvious that something different is happening on the top versus the bottom. So what are we doing when we look at these EEG signals? What we're doing is we're actually looking at the frequency content of the signal. We trained our eyes to be able to see certain things within the EEG, and we've trained ourselves to know what is normal, what is abnormal, what is symmetric, asymmetric. And this allows us to find seizures and other abnormalities. What we do with the eye is something that we also can do with computers. But before I start talking about that, I'd like to show something a bit of a blast from the past. So anyone my age or older may remember these graphic equalizers. So there used to be things called stereos where you would have uh, your music playing and you could decide how much of different frequencies you wanted to come out of the speaker. So this is a picture of the equalizer on top. And each one of those dials is set to a different frequency. If you 
look really close, you can see that the ones on the very left, 20 hertz, 25 hertz, and then on the far right, it goes up to 20 kilohertz. And we've got a left speaker and a right speaker. And then this example in the lower right shows that, for instance, this equalizer, they don't want any power in the 200 hertz band. And so they've turned this down. So what this equalizer is doing is looking at spectral bands. And we can split up those bands. And when we have these things, the, if you had one, you'd play around and say, I want more bass. So you'd push the bass side up higher. If you want more treble, you push up the treble side higher. That is playing with the spectrum or the power spectrum, which really is the key to most of what I'm going to talk about. I'd like to go back even further though, to one of the first papers that talked about this. This is way back in 1975 by Harold Shipton. And he made some interesting comments. Although there have been many tech detailed technological improvements in instrument design, the EEG machine of the 1970s is a direct lineal descendant of the galvanometer and the smoked drum. Most of us probably don't remember either of those. Then he makes this daring claim. This paper considers the extent to which new instrumental methods can be expected to displace the eyeball as an analytic tool. Finally, it discusses the long awaited and often announced marriage between EEG -er and computer scientists. And to show us what could be done, he has these old oscilloscope tracings. Now, what this isn't a true EEG, this is a, a manufactured EEG. And it starts off with a sine wave at low frequency, then it goes a little bit faster, and then it goes slow again, and then medium. And this corresponds to uh, two periods of delta, a period of alpha, and a period of theta. Now, what we could do if we had something like an equalizer to look at the spectral power is we could split this up into little pieces and say the first portion, if I looked just at that portion, that would be just kind of a delta power. And then the next one is more of an alpha. Then there's delta again, and then there's theta again. And if I took this entire piece of data and summarized all of the power that exists, I would get something that looks like this signal. So this is a smoothed power spectrum of this EEG signal. There's a little bit of two hertz, a little bit of five, and a little bit of 10. Now, every period in which you sample this EEG would give you a slightly different answer if that EEG changed a little bit. And what we have on the bottom are a sequence of snippets of data. So the very first one on the bottom occurs, now this is true EEG. Uh, this is a person and they, they tested their EEG for about six seconds. And then every six seconds, they tested it again. And you can see as the time goes up, the time is moving, going along in the up and the Y axis. Uh, this person has a little bit of alpha power. And then every once in a while, you get this big spike in alpha power. And as an EEG, -er, I look at this and I say, well, I probably know exactly what's happening in those six seconds. That's probably when the technician has asked this person to close their eyes. And you see this nice alpha frequency pop out of the background, right at nine and a half hertz. And every time they open their eyes, that frequency goes away. And we can analyze this using a tool, which luckily most of us never have to worry about. It's a tool called the Fourier transform. The Fourier transform is very easy to explain if you're talking about perfect sinusoids. So on the upper left here, we have a time series. This is just a pure sine wave, a five kilohertz sine wave. And I can express that time series, which is a sine wave, as a single line in its power spectrum. In the frequency band, it is a five kilohertz, one volt high line. And I could go back and forth. They, they mean exactly the same thing. Now, if I take that time series and add in a second sine wave and just sum them together, I get a signal that looks like the second line. And in the frequency bands, I see a five kilohertz and a 10 kilohertz line. If I add in a third one at 20 kilohertz, I get a 510 and a 20 kilohertz. So 
This relationship can go on and on. The problem is there aren't many perfect sine waves in the world. And what we see most of all are things that look like other shapes. For instance, a square wave, this is now getting pretty complicated in the, the frequency spectrum, but a square wave can be represented as an infinite series of sine waves at different frequencies. That doesn't really matter. What does matter is what happens when we actually look at an EEG signal. Something in the time domain can be transformed into something in the frequency domain. And it is a uh, very, it, it just flips back and forth. It is a, a lossless transformation. And the equation for doing this, you do not have to do it. It's kind of a, it's a, a difficult equation to understand. It has an imaginary number and an exponential and a, a bunch of confusing things in there. Uh, luckily there's computers that do this all for us. But what this Fourier transform gives us is it takes something in the time domain and shows us what it looks like in frequency. And this really is the basis of all of our analysis. There's other things that we do, but that kind of has been the, the most important thing. So a spectral analysis, looking at the spectrum of frequencies. And back in about 20 years ago, uh, several companies started to play with these tools. And finally, uh, looking at, at what Shipton said back in 1975, we have this marriage between the EEG -er and the computer scientist. And there are several different tools that are commercially available. Most of them are based on power spectra. So let's get into EEG and see what power spectra look like in EEG. So here is an example from a paper uh, that was looking at something else, is looking at what REM sleep does. But they had this figure in here showing what happens during different times of REM sleep versus wakefulness. And what they've shown is the power spectrum, just like I showed before, in three different time periods. During the beginning of REM, the end of REM, and then during wakefulness to show you the difference. And the black line in wakefulness has this beautiful peak right at 10 hertz. And that tells you that this person, as you can see in the example of their EEG, they have a beautiful alpha rhythm. During REM sleep, they do have some of that higher frequency, but it's a little bit broken up in this particular patient. And so the amount of 10 Hertz power is not as high as it is during wakefulness. We can look at this power spectrum and it actually tells us a lot of information. If I looked at power spectrum many times in a row, I would get something that looked like this. So just like uh, in the previous figure, every few seconds, I'm going to check another piece of power spectrum and draw another line. And you can see in this case, we've got a pretty consistent 10 Hertz frequency. Now it's a little tedious to draw this big stack of lines. And so instead we can flatten that stack and draw it as a heat map. So this is the same exact information, but instead of lines, I've now made the high values red and the low values dark and we can smooth it out with, with a nice uh, visual filter so it looks pretty. I can look at this and this is 20 minutes of data. And in one picture, I can tell you what this patient has been doing for the past 20 minutes. They've been sitting there, relaxed, not sleepy with their eyes closed, showing this beautiful alpha rhythm. Now we see a very interesting use for this. But we might go longer than 20 minutes, so why don't we turn it on its side? And instead of having stacks going up, we're gonna have stacks going to the right. And every few seconds, I'm gonna add another line and keep extending this line further and further to the right. And if I do that over a long period of time, I get something that's known as a spectrogram. This is a spectrogram of a 30 minute EEG. And I can look at this, and I can tell you exactly what this patient did. So for the first 12 minutes, they sat there, they were obeying the instructions from the technician, keeping their eyes closed. Every once in a while, they would open their eyes, that being shown by these very thin blue lines at about four and a half minutes, for instance. And then at about 12 minutes, they started to get drowsy. 
the algorithm disappeared and they started showing more delta frequencies down at the bottom. Somewhere in the middle, as they were starting to fall asleep, they woke up really briefly, then they fell back asleep again. This is now to about minute 17. Woke up again, fell asleep again. They slept through 20 minutes, woke up again at 22 minutes, fell asleep through 25 minutes. And the technician came in, woke them up, started asking them questions, and did the typical 30 minute EEG. This is what most normal 30 minute EEGs look like if we looked at their spectrogram. It's very informative because we can tell this is probably a healthy person, at least that they're awake and uh, able to go to sleep. Now, whether they're having any epileptiform discharges, this says nothing about that at all. This is just saying, what is the summary of every few seconds? What is their peak frequencies? Now, this is great. However, when we start doing things outside of the very controlled laboratory, we start getting a lot of garbage. And by garbage, I mean artifacts. Every time somebody chews or has any type of muscle artifact or a seizure or anything that's causing these discharges, muscle produces a lot of electricity. And the electricity that it produces is in every frequency. So you think of how many muscle units are firing when someone is clenching their teeth or having a generalized seizure. Uh, this is not one particular frequency, it's every frequency. And so if we look at the power spectrum during that period, what we're going to see is that every frequency is high. Uh, some of you have probably made the mistake of putting on a low pass filter at 20 Hertz and what you get if someone's showing you a lot of muscle artifact is you get 20 Hertz, you get whatever you've left behind because it's got every single frequency buried in there. It's really tricky to, to avoid this type of artifact. What we can do with this EEG and our spectrum is start to talk about it in ways that are clinically relevant to us. So we have made a distinction between delta power and theta power, alpha and beta. Each of these things are simply frequency bands. And I've shown here in the four colors about where those bands would lie on this graph. And if I wanted to summarize what this patient was doing, not in terms of every frequency, but in terms of just these four frequency bands, I could add up all of the power that existed from zero to four hertz, four to eight hertz, 8.5 to 13 hertz, and 13 hertz up to 30 hertz or whatever. And by adding those together, I would get something that's known as the absolute band power. And this is the same EEG type of information that I showed before, but now instead of a spectrogram, I'm giving you the sum of delta in red, theta in yellow, alpha in green, and beta in blue. So here we can see that there's a lot of delta during some periods, there's not as much delta during other periods. This particular one, this is accurate, but it's a little bit difficult to read because what really matters is the relative band power most of the time. So we're not always concerned with how much delta there is. We want to know if there is more delta than there should be, or if there's more beta than there should be. This is the same information as before, going back here, except in every single column, I have taken the percent of each one. So I've normalized it to the maximum value of all of them put together. And what you see is of the total, what percent of it is blue or what percent of it is red. And I can display these things in different time periods. So if I go for 30 seconds at a time, I get the graph on top, which is a little bit smoother than the one on the bottom, which is 10 seconds at a time. Uh, that is more temporally accurate. Uh, however, as you see, it jumps around a lot and it might be harder to read. There is another way to analyze power, and this one is not as familiar to most people. It's known as the envelope detector. So in this case, we take the EEG signal and bandpass filter it between frequencies that we think are useful. 
And then in this band pass filter data, we take every second or any, any uh, specific time period that you designate and you see what is the maximum amplitude that is seen in that band power. And this is a, comp a comparison. On the bottom in gray is the total power. This is the sum of all power from zero to 30 Hertz. And on top is an envelope saying, I'm just interested in four to seven Hertz. I don't want to look at the other information. And this is a little more focused. It's pretty similar, however, because you've, you've focused it on one band, we can split this piece of information out. So how does this work? We've got a com comparison of the two here. On top is a spectrogram. On the bottom are uh, different, uh, different envelope detectors for specific frequency ranges. So in this case, it's from six to 14 Hertz. And this is the summary of nearly two hours of data. And we can see over these two hours, different things happened. If I click in this trend analysis, at this point under the G in the spectrogram, you can see here that every frequency was high at that time. And I know because I've looked at this a lot of time, I knew beforehand that if I clicked here, I was probably going to see muscle artifact because that's what makes every frequency high. If I click instead at an area where I see a lot of blue, what I see is just low frequency. This is some, this person perhaps is asleep or sedated at this time. And then if I click at the part that looks a little bit more interesting, this is a seizure. Now in this particular patient, their seizures were more on the right hemisphere than the left. And you can see the top line here is left, the average of all of the electrodes and the right is the average of all electrodes on the right. And it is brighter on the right side. So we expect to see more power in the theta to alpha range. And probably if we clicked at the beginning of this seizure, it would be a little bit faster. And if we clicked at the end, it would be a little bit slower. This is quite useful over time. And I'll show you in a, in a, a practical application of this in a couple of minutes. Another older analysis, uh, I personally don't use this because I, it is primarily used for neonates, uh, is the AI, the Amplitude Integrated EEG. And this is a single trace that is the summary of usually just one or two channels. Uh, they sometimes do it just across the forehead. And in neonates, this uh, is a little bit more pertinent. I personally have not found it to be useful in adults, uh, but they can follow this value and you learn what this individual does. You can see here in, in letter A, the AI EEG has gone high. And if you click in that region, you get these rhythmic discharges. Uh, here, the AI EEG is a little bit more sporadic and you just get slowing. And here it is rhythmic again, but a little bit different than before. So uh, this has been around a really long time. Every uh, EEG analysis uh, that I know uses this, uh, but I personally haven't used it. And then uh, there's lots of other ones, but I just wanted to mention, so that the, the tools that are spoken of the most are spike and seizure detection. And that's actually not what I'm talking about today. Uh, and the reason why is because I am an EEGer um, and I have to teach our fellows not to trust these things. Uh, no offense. We, ha we have to learn how to do this on our own. Now, not to say that they're, they're useless. They're actually very useful, but there's really two ways that these detectors can be used. One of them is to say, I have a detector that is going to find the seizures for me. And the problem with that is we already know that clinicians rarely agree on what a seizure is. So where it might be useful sometimes, uh, we know that it's going to fail many times just because there's so much ambiguity in seizures that we are reading. The one that I prefer as 
an epileptologist is number two. So we can use these detectors as a summary to help us go through the EEG, but we still have to go through it. So what I would like to do is a practical demonstration. Um, before that, I'd like to tell you what we're getting at. So uh, I tell all of our fellows here that I want them to be Jedi EEGers. And this is a, a reference to Star Wars. This is Luke Skywalker with his lightsaber. And he became a true Jedi Knight when he was able to build his own lightsaber. And that's what I would like to show you guys today how to build your own detector so that you can do whatever you want with it. And I think these types of tools are extremely helpful. Uh, we've got long-term EEGs, and I'll show you a couple of examples in a minute of how we can use these things. And if we understand what these tools are doing, we can use them uh, to really help us get some things along. Now, there are other algorithms and companies usually promote their own algorithms and some of them are good some of them might not be good and there there could be uses for for many of them however the algorithms i'm going to show you today are generics so just like we, we like to go with generic medications we're going to go with generic eeg tools today these are things that every eeg analysis program probably has access to and the two Examples I'm going to show you are how to follow burst suppression overnight and how to build a custom seizure detector. Now, as I do this, I would just like to bring out uh, the main point is that we should be brave. So these uh, tools look a little bit scary and there's a lot of things going on. It can be very overwhelming when you see all of these panels. I tried to go over a few of them uh, so that you recognize them when I show them to you. Uh, but I would encourage you to see these uh, programs as a sandbox. You really can't break anything. Uh, you can play around with these things. And if you mess something completely up, just close the EG, open it back up again, and, and it will be back where it started. Uh, but you might be able to find something that's really useful. Uh, and then I would also like to put in a shout out to Sue Herman, who's actually going to be one of our speakers in a later session. She taught me all of this stuff. So um, this is a, a good testament to her teaching. I've, I've fallen in love with these tools well before uh, we even had Persist Insight, which is what I will be showing right now. Uh, I used a different program and I've actually shown you some pictures from different programs in this talk today. So I'm going to switch to a different screen. And what I'm doing here is literally the exact thing you can do from home. So I have this file is open on a computer in the hospital. Now the computer is sitting right there, it has nothing and not connected to this computer, but this, this is the exact view I get from home. So if I log in, I VPN into the hospital network, and I open up a remote desktop, I open up this exact picture. And what I've done, I've, I'm simulating having a patient on burst suppression in the ICU. And I've just been called at two o'clock in the morning and the ICU fellow wants to know if their burst suppression is still running okay. And I already know the answer. I've glanced at the page and the answer is yes you're at 50% burst suppression. I don't have to page through anything. I already know because I can see this suppression ratio here at the very bottom of the page. Now this is Persist's main page and I'm ignoring everything on this page except for the very bottom here because all I care about right now is the suppression ratio. Now I'll page through some, some of the EEG here so you can see what's going on. Now in ages past, if you were lucky enough to be able to log into the hospital network and you got this call, you might have to page through. And depending on how slow your computer connection is and whatever type of uh, software you have running, it may have taken a few minutes. It's two o'clock in the morning. You wanna go just back to sleep. However, in this case, I can pop this thing on and I can tell them immediately. And I know what's happening because I've already been looking at this EEG during the day. And I know that this patient has a pretty solid 
burst suppression. This is just a, a propofol burst suppression. The patient's, uh, this particular patient is a post-anoxia patient. Um, and they wanted them in a little, they're cool, and they wanted them in a little bit burst suppression. Now I could page through hundreds of these pages, or I can just look at this suppression ratio here on the bottom. Uh, this is, uh, this particular ratio is uh, a proprietary algorithm. However, um, there are various ways of doing this. In this case, they're saying what ratio of the EEG is suppressed, and it goes from zero to 100%. I can change this range if I wanted to see a little bit better. So now the top is 50%. So I know it's getting up to about 60%. And I know the answer. So that's great. Now let's say they call me back and it's hours later. And I look at this right away and I can tell that this patient is really not in burst suppression at all. I've got this at two hour windows. What I'm going to do is squash this window down a little bit so you can see what this patient did a little bit better. And you see at the beginning of the EEG, they were quite suppressed. And over these eight hours, it slowly diminished, the suppression diminished over time until by the end of the record, the birth suppression is basically gone. Now, I actually took care of this patient and I popped this thing on at about six o'clock in the morning and I looked at this and I was very happy because this is a post-anoxia patient. And the fact that they got out of burst suppression is actually a pretty good sign. So this is less than 24 hours. I think the patient was even still cool at the moment. And I know that they're just kind of pretty low and slow. And I was quite hopeful that this patient would get better. I could have paged through hundreds and hundreds of pages to get that same information. But as you can see, every page is pretty much the same. And looking at the summary here, I could have told you that. So looking at the spectrogram, it's basically just always delta. Looking at the AEEG, it's basically flat. All of these things are flat. And I, I would have been able to see that quite well. So this is useful. This is a very common ICU question. How is our patient doing? How is the birth suppression? And you can tell them right away. Uh, what I've seen, I, I don't have a patient like this, but uh, sometimes this birth suppression will suddenly drop off. Uh, and you can see exactly the time that it happens. I can glance, I'm looking at eight hours at a time here. And let's imagine that at two o'clock, they turned off their, uh, they, they turned off their sedation. We would be able to see that, that the birth suppression disappeared. And they would say, how's the, how's the sedation going? And we say, well, it looks like you turned off your sedation at two o'clock. And they look, oh, actually, you're right. So it makes us look very good. We can uh, analyze a lot of EEG at a time. I really highly recommend it. So um, the FFT spectrogram kind of has this information. Uh, you can see that it's mostly delta. It's not the easiest. Uh, something that I will show you more on the next patient, we have made our own algorithms with an envelope detector. So what we have here, this is pretty boring as we hope it to be in this particular patient, but this envelope detector, the top row here is the envelope from one to five hertz. The next is four to seven hertz. The next is seven to 14. And the last is a summary, it's two to 20 hertz. So these four bands correspond to little pieces of that spectrogram. But what's also useful for this is we're able to change the area of the brain that we're looking at. You can see that we have left hemisphere in blue, right hemisphere in red. And this program is actually very helpful because we can change what we're looking at. So maybe we just wanted to look at left anterior. Uh, this information is already in there and it's going to take a summary of just the left anterior electrodes. And then I'll make this into the right anterior electrodes. And again, this patient is boring because they're just sitting in the ICU 
What we can see, however, is at the beginning, there's not a lot of delta power. And near the end, the delta power has gotten stronger and stronger. One other thing that's useful for uh, these trends is you can see whenever something out of the ordinary happens. So we have hours here where literally nothing happened. I can click on any spot here and I'll tell you that every one of these pages is gonna look exactly the same because you can tell the power content hasn't changed at all. Now there are these little blips. So you might wanna click on the blips and see, well, what made that Delta power go up right at this moment? And well, what do you know? Something happened right at that blip. I can search through eight hours of data and I can find, in this case, this is when the nurse is shaking the patient. I can find this exact moment just by clicking on this one dot. What about this line here? Let's see what happened there when the theta power got a little bit higher. And it looks like there was some movement artifact, which just made that, or popping electrode is probably what that is, causing that theta power to go up. So this patient's boring, but we want the patient to be boring because we want to go back to bed. So we're going to put that patient away, and now we're going to get a patient that's a little bit more interesting. So this is a patient that was brought in, and we are looking for seizures. And this patient had a couple of seizures that were found. There were two that when they looked at the patients, they thought, eh, it's not quite a seizure, but I'm going to start with the one that was found. So here we're looking at the standard. We've got left, right, parasagittal, left, right, temporal. And there's a bit of an attenuation. And then there's kind of this uh, complex spike and wave activity that seems to be over broad region, a little bit more over the left parasagittal than the right parasagittal, which is interesting. And OK, now I know that this is this particular patient's seizure. It's their typical seizure. So it starts off with some attenuation, it gets a little bit fast, and then we get these kind of diffuse spike waves. Now I can go through and wait for the patient to push the button every time. But what's interesting here is that when I look at this distribution of the trends, we see a pretty characteristic change. So the top here is delta. And we see both left and right delta got high. The next is theta. They both went high, but then after the seizure, the left theta stayed high in the temporal region. And what's going on is after that seizure, this patient was a, had a lot of kind of complex epileptiform activity more on the left than the right, these kind of poly spikes. And that shows up as this increase in the blue that you see in the temporal region. Also in the alpha frequency, we saw a spike. And then the summary of everything, we saw a spike. Well, let's see what happened in these other two times when we thought they might have had an event. So we're clicking on this first not quite event. Well, what's happened here, first of all, is I'm cheating a little bit because I'm using the artifact reduction. So if I did not use artifact reduction, unfortunately, a couple of the electrodes are pretty messy right now. Now Persist has this uh, artifact reduction, which I, I definitely recommend. It's very nice. It throws away data when it says it's junk, it gives you a dotted line. You don't want to be filtering that. That's just pure junk. But at other times, there's some areas where it says, you know, I see a lot of muscle activity, but I think probably what it looks like underneath is this. We can't be sure, but it's better than nothing. So we've reduced the artifact a little bit, but some of the channels are dead. But, oh, sure enough, there's another one of those bursts. So is isn't quite as long uh, afterwards. It's not quite as messy, but when I look at the trends, during this event, I do kind of see this same pattern where there's this spike in activity going up. And we'll look at the, that was at four o'clock. There's another one at 
6.08 p.m. Same thing, we see one of these bursts and that one's really fast. Looking at the data here though, the trends here, that's pretty messy. So there's a lot of stuff going on. I probably couldn't have picked that seizure out from the background. So I've got three examples, but what I really liked best was the one that we found that really stood out looking at this very characteristic pattern. And so I looked through not 24 hours of EEG, I looked through snippets of the trends. So I'm going to the beginning of this 24 hour period and I see that there's a bunch of spikes going up in this trending analysis. And so I can click on every one of these spikes. Well, look at that. There's some activity that looks like one of those seizure bursts. I can click here. That one's a little bit faster. I don't know if it's a seizure or not, but it's interesting. Here, we've got another one coming. Uh, that might just be movement. If I click in areas where these things aren't happening, there's really not as much going on. And now I'm just scrolling through the EEG. Click on this, looks like there's a bunch in a row. And sure enough, that does look like kind of that ictal activity. I don't know whether I'd call it a seizure or not, but I'm not being binary about things. I'm just trying to find what's abnormal. And so going ahead, there's another one of those bursts and still going ahead. There's another one and another one. And all these things are showing up in this Delta trending. So I'm gonna call that a run of bursts. Now I'm gonna click through a bunch more of these trends. Now on this page, if I was reading the EEG, I would have to go through probably every single page. So there's a lot going on here. I'm not sure what's going on. It might just be movement, but I would not be comfortable bypassing this two hour segment of data because there's a lot of change going on. This one, once I get to the middle here, you know, I'd want to be comfortable. I definitely am going to be reading this, but I would be able to see, you know, there's probably after I've looked at several pages of this, I can be more and more confident that probably not much is going on. And I go through, here's that seizure from before. Uh, a lot going on here. I'd probably have to be more careful during that period. A lot going on here, but then they go to sleep. So we see the patient goes to sleep and their sleep isn't all that normal. But we see this pattern in the delta frequency more than in the other frequencies where they've gone into this kind of uh, messy slow wave sleep pattern. It goes away here and it's gonna come back over here. And I'm going through hours at a time here and then it goes away. But then right near the end, now I know the, the official report of this EEG did not find a seizure at this place I'm about to click. I said, that looks kind of interesting. Um, and I'm gonna click through and see what that spike was. And sure enough, that looks like another seizure. And it's a seizure that is not in the official report. I just looked at the report uh, yesterday to make sure it's not there, but I've added it in. It does look like a seizure. So now I'm not saying you can read the entire EEG this way, but if I know this is the seizure that I'm looking for, I can design a seizure detector to find that exact seizure. So for instance, now this patient, this patient's seizures are a little bit more generalized than I was hoping for this example, but let's say what we really like is what's happening in F7T3. You can see F7T3 seems to be pretty active here. So I'm gonna compare and, and, sorry, not just the location, let's also say what frequency am I looking at? Well, I like, I like the spike waves that are delta, but I also kind of like the alpha. So I'm going to take my delta and I'm going to make an F7T3 versus F8T4 delta detector. And then I'm also going to make an F7T3 versus F8T4 alpha detector. 
I'm going to change the gain here so I can see what it's doing. Well, it looks like the alpha didn't work. That was a failure. But looking at this, now there's a lot. The left side has tons and tons of delta frequencies. But it, the right side didn't pop up at all until there was that seizure. So what if I use that type of detector? Well, I know that's sleep already. I'm going backwards in time. How well would that have worked? Now we've got a little bit more specific to the type of thing we're looking for. So I've clicked on one here. That ended up being muscle artifact, but actually there was some epileptic activity at that time. And this is not perfect. I didn't go through and find the absolute perfect patient that, that I could uh, show you a beautiful custom lightsaber for. But just to show you what these six seizure events look like. So the run of bursts shows a lot of this pattern. The not quite seizure is in the midst of a lot of stuff that I wouldn't be able to, to skim quickly this also. The seizure that they found shows that beautiful pattern. One of the seizures that was missed is the one I just showed you. And then there's another one that they missed at 1920, which is in the middle of everything. Now, as a demonstration that this is real, it turns out this was an intracranial patient. So we're gonna go throw away all those scalp electrodes and see this patient looked like intracranially, and this is kind of fun. It'd be great if we could do this with all of our patients, but this is the run of bursts. And intracranially, this is a big grid. This is an eight by eight grid over the left frontal parasagittal region. So sitting right and actually down over the temp lateral temporal too. So it's got a lot of the, the, the same electrodes. And this period of run of spikes, actually what we see is a lot of uh, ictal looking activity in uh, the 42 and 43, and actually maybe some tiny little seizures occurring on those channels that happened over and over again. Not a seizure, but clearly some abnormal activity. I go to that first not quite seizure, and what do you know? Intracranially, we have big electro decrement, some fast activity, and then that fast activity goes into a very brief seizure. And I know this is a seizure because that this type of activity didn't happen at other times. The other not quite seizure looks exactly the same as that last one. It's a little bit longer. The seizure that we found looks exactly the same, but it persists longer. And you've got these big spike wave discharges and we see some other activity that we hadn't noticed before. And then afterwards, where we thought we saw a lot of activity giving us that theta, it turns out we got some pretty nasty looking buzzes right at those electrodes that we thought were interesting. One of the seizures that we missed turns out to be a seizure as well. And then the other one that we missed, this was the one that everybody missed, looks exactly the same. So this, in this case, I've built my own lightsaber. I know what I'm looking for. It allows me to go through large portions of the EEG at a time. I definitely have to be reading the EEG. By no means am I saying I can look just at the trends and read the entire EEG. But once you know what your patient looks like, what the trends look like, you can find periods of time where you're pretty confident. You know, I know that at this point right here, there's no seizure here. I don't have to read those pages because I know what this patient's seizures look like. When it gets really quiet, you can be confident. When things get really messy, you have to read more. But if you had periods, this is now switching to that other patient. If you had a couple of hours of data that look like this, you really can be very confident of what you're looking at. So uh, just to, to be clear, the trends that I've shown were all done just on scalp EEG. I was lucky in this patient, we had scalp running at the same time. So I ran everything on the scalp and then we just happened to have intracranial at the same time. So 
don't be afraid of playing around with these things. There are lots of tools. I've shown you just a few of them. Um, all of these panels, um, Michael Guest can show you what all of they what all of them do. There are lots of things that you can do custom. So this thing that I've been showing you is something that we made uh, specifically. We use it here on all of our patients at Michigan. We like being able to split up the different frequencies and being able to, to see what regions of the brain we're looking at so we can build our own lightsabers. Um, Maria has this file uh, to share if anybody else wants to have access to it. Um, there are lots of other tools that Persist can build for you, or you can ask them for a, a different version, the, uh, ex the research version of Persist, where you can build your own tools if you want to play around the sandbox yourself. So don't be afraid. That is the end of my talk for today. I'm going to switch back to uh, show you Luke and his lightsaber. And we can go to some questions. Hi, Dr. Stacy. Thank you so much for that wonderful talk. Um, so we did have a few questions come in. And um, I guess I'll start with the most recent ones. We had some questions about the intracranial and scalp EEG. There was a question on whether or not that was a simultaneous recording. Um, yeah, and how I, many, go ahead. Yeah, so it was a simultaneous recording. I, I, uh, I, I realized that throwing the intracranial there kind of throws everybody for a loop because uh, most of the algorithms we have for persist do not work on intracranial. Now you could make them, you could absolutely do it. The problem is the names of your electrodes have to be programmed into whatever algorithm you're using. Mm -hmm. um, and because every patient is different, um, you would have to do that on your own. But uh, this right. was done at the same time. so we. As standard of care here, we always have, this was a grid, but even when we have SEEG, we put the, the scalp EEG on at the same time. Yes. And I think I saw that there were 64 channels on the intracranial recording. Yes. There was, great. There was a question about that as well. Um, okay, we have a question from one of the very first patients I think that you showed, if you remember, it was the first suppression uh, patient. And the question was, the EEG you showed as first suppression just showed very low amplitude EEG, not in bursts, question mark. So um, I'm not quite sure exactly the meaning of the question, but it sounds like um, something between the, the EEG and the trend was not quite clear. All right, so I think this, this is a philosophical question <laughs> rather than, uh, okay. so absolutely, um, the term burst suppression usually refers to true bursts. This patient does not have the classic pentobarbital burst suppression. This patient has what I call a propofol burst suppression. Now, there's other versions of this, although I think it may have been more a post-anoxia burst suppression. So the burst is this little bubble and then the suppression. Um, there are various levels and of, uh, of burst suppression. Um, but this, we do get a little, a little burst, whether you want to, uh, you, you can argue that that's not a true burst, like, like pentobar burst would be. And uh, I agree that it's not like that. However, it is a brief burst of activity followed by complete, complete suppression. And, um, Luckily, because we do follow a lot of patients like this, uh, luckily the burst suppression ratio does count this as a true suppression. So. Okay, great. Um, let's see, more questions. Okay, there's a question about uh, in an ICU setting, the nurses are applying electrodes. They are applying six electrodes, including ref and ground. What four other portable recording electrodes would you advise applying in general? Currently F3, P3, F4, and P4 for a two-channel EEG recording. A two-channel EEG recording? Um, that's a tough question. Um, so I am, I am pretty biased that I like a whole EEG. 
Uh -huh. um, we, we usually do not read, that's kind of like a BIS monitor type thing. Um, it really depends on what you're looking for. If you're looking for seizures, it's gonna be tough um, with just two channels. Uh, you say you're doing F3 and F4. Yeah, it. that's, you, you get what you record, I guess, is, is the question there. So um, if you only have, if you only have uh, six and that's the only thing you have available, uh, that you're going to be getting parasagittal there. Um, I'm, I'm not really sure what, what the best would be. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah. Okay, great. And then there's some other questions about how much of the EEG you actually visualize before you're confident about what you're seeing. And then also combined with that, how can you identify and track patterns on the ictal interictal continuum, meaning characterizing a pattern as evolving or fluctuating? Right. So, um, so Gabe Mart's question, uh, that's, that's a great question, Gabe. So the, um, I like to read one full day, full on looking at everything. Um, now, if, if you see in the trends that, you know, things are completely flat for hours and hours and hours, and, and you see none of, none of the spikes in the trending at all, I might, cheat a little bit and say, hey, you know, it's pretty obvious they're asleep for these two hours. I, I might skip a little bit faster, but definitely at the beginning, you have to get confident. Like, what is this patient's seizure? What are they looking like? So when you've built this lightsaber, say, I'm looking at just this frequency in just this place, you are absolutely saying, I'm probably going to miss another type of seizure. So you, uh, you have to be really careful. If that patient has only ever shown one type of seizure ever, uh, you can you can get away with that. But this is really, um, in this case, I say, this is seizure type one. How many of seizure type one do they have? And you can go through. If there's a seizure type two, you have to look for it. You have to characterize it. Um, uh, but that where this is most useful is a person that's having acute repetitive seizures that they're all the same. And you can say, you know, I see one every 10 minutes. Uh, I made a change and then I look an hour later and they've all gone. And then I look two hours later, I can just look at the envelopes or whatever. And I can say they're still gone without going through all two hours of data. That's the main, the main use for this. The other question from Abdullah, um, interictal continuum. Uh, that one, so that's a little tricky. Every patient's patterns are a little bit different. Um, I learned as a fellow to just leave these things open all the time. And I'm reading the EEG, like at least a full day of EEG, full on. I'm not doing the trends at all but I'm looking at the trends. And every time I find something, whether it be a continuum or whatever, if it's showing up on the trends, then I start to trust it. And it might be just this one pattern, say they've got you know little bursts of this particular patient that we're looking at here had these bursts of kind of spike waves and that gave bursts of Delta. And so I can kind of go through and look for this Delta in this particular patient but you get every possible answer. Sometimes you get a seizure that you think would be obvious to see on the trends and it just doesn't show up. The trends are worthless. Sometimes you see something that's just a brief pattern, like, a, like one really nasty spike that has some, some uh, waveforms afterwards. Sometimes that shows up on the trends and you can find them. So it all just depends on, on each patient. So I like to read with these envelopes open. Um, I keep talking about envelopes. There was a question before about why envelopes versus other things. Um, there's no, the envelope is pretty much the same data as just the basic spectrogram. I don't like the spectrogram as much because I like to focus on specific frequencies. I think it's giving us too much information at a time. For me, it's just hard to follow what's going on. And uh, the spectrogram does allow you just like that to change, you know, maybe I just wanted anterior versus, oops, I, I messed everything up here. Just to prove to you that 
I could just restart this and it would fix it. So you can do the same thing with, with the spectrogram. I, I don't like it just because I like to, I can kind of only think of one thing at once. So I like the custom envelopes. Um, so can you design trends for intracranial data? You can, but you'd have to design your own. Yeah, I think you covered that one. That was a good one. Um, we can, and you can you can contact us at support at persist.com uh, for assistance customizing uh, any of your trends or learning about how to create trends for intracranial data as well. Um, Dr. Stacy also mentioned that we are able to actually provide you with the MMX file um, that he uses and was talking about today. So you can also contact us um, at support at persist.com as well. Um, to begin a discussion about how best to help you begin using uh, the MMX that he's using if you want to test it or play around with it to see um, if it would benefit you at all. Dr. Stacey, you've done a, a great job of keeping up with the questions here. Um, I think we may have gotten most of them. If any of you have questions that are unanswered, uh, please do contact us, support at persist.com. We also we'll get a record of questions that were answered. So if I see any that were not answered, um, I will try to reach out specifically to answer those questions. Um, on the ability to, um, uh, Gabe, I see your last question, any ability to quantify the time saving per day of LTM reading. I actually have a publication that I can share with you. Um, it came from a center in the Netherlands and they actually looked specifically at this for LTM recordings. Um, so I can share that with you. Okay, and that might be it, unless there are any other questions. I don't see any others that are pertinent. pertinent. Is there anything else that you'd like to say, Dr. Stacy, or share with us? Uh, just to reiterate, be brave. <laughs> you, 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 uh, the, the way to get comfortable is just to have them on as you're reading, and even if it's just, I'm just gonna turn them on and I'm gonna read the way I normally was. And then every once in a while, I'll just glance, glance to the side and see what it's doing. And after a while, you'll start to realize when it works and when it doesn't work. You know, there's absolutely times when it, it's worthless. It just depends on the patient. And then sometimes it's fantastic. You're like, hey, no, it's showing up. I can find exactly what I'm looking for. And it's so easy to find in, in the trends. Uh, it, it's, it, it can be very useful, um, but you just gotta get your hands dirty and play around with it. I really like that advice. Yeah, I think for anything, you know, anything that's new, you have to sort of get used to it before you can begin to understand it. So I think it's really great advice uh, to have it on and watch it and then continue watching what you know, which is the EEG signal. And then you can begin to learn uh, when the trends work and, and when they're confusing. Um, and then, um, then you can reach out for assistance or if you have questions. So I wanna thank you all very much for joining. This has been a lot of fun. Um, I learned a lot also from you, Dr. Stacy. so thank you. And I'll just say that the next um, session of Persist Grand Rounds will be on Monday, November 29th. We were, we're going to try to have them on Monday. I think it's usually the last Monday of the month. So that's what we're aiming for. Please do go to persist.com slash ground rounds to keep up with the schedule. Um, and I th think that's it. So I wanna thank you all again very much. Thank you, Dr. Stacy. Okay. okay, bye everybody, thank you.